In this video, we'll be talking about how to perform multivariate GWAS using genomic SEM. Multivariate GWAS consists of four primary steps. The first one being munging the summary statistics, which we'll talk about in just a second. The second to run multivariable LD score regression within genomic structural equation modeling to obtain the genetic covariance and sampling covariance matrices across the GWAS summary statistics. A note to say that these first two steps mirror the steps that you would go through to estimate a model without individual SNP effects, including for the user model and common factor functions that Michelle talked about in the previous video, and do not need to be run again just for the purposes of running a multivariate GWAS. In the third step, you'll prepare the summary statistics for multivariate GWAS using the SumStats function. And finally, you'll actually run the multivariate GWAS using common factor or user GWAS. For this example, we're going to use the five psychiatric traits from the GitHub example for the p-factor across schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, major depressive disorder, PTSD, and anxiety. And these are all publicly available summary stats that are directly available for download. The first step, again, is to munge the data, where munge literally just refers to the general process of converting raw data from one form to another. Munge is primarily converting the summary statistics to z-statistics. It's aligning all the summary stats to the same reference allele, and it's restricting them to HapMap 3 SNPs, both because these tend to be well imputed, and even with just those 1.1 million HapMap 3 SNPs, you tend to get a reasonable estimate of the heritability. So sometimes people will be really concerned when they have this large set of 8 to 10 million SNPs, and then they run it through Munge, and they only have about one million SNPs left, but this isn't cause for concern because that is enough to get an accurate estimate of heritability using the LDSC equation. When you run Munge, it's going to produce a .log file for each of your traits, and this is something that's important to check just to make sure all of your columns are being interpreted correctly. I think in general there can be this push to plug forward with the results and not really take a look at your data or some of these log files that are produced by different packages, but you definitely want to make sure before going through all of the additional steps that the data is being read in appropriately. And one particular thing that I've highlighted here is for case control traits, you really want to make sure that that effect column is being interpreted correctly as either an odds ratio or not. So for MDD, I know that this is an odds ratio and I see that the munge function is interpreting that as such. I just want to go over to R now just to walk through this code as we go along. So up here, I've just set the working directory to where I've stored all of these files. This will look a little bit different in terms of how you do this if you're on something that's not a Mac operating system. And then I load in genomic SEM and also this function data.table. Before running Munge, something I want to highlight is that I actually have to do something to the schizophrenia summary statistics so that Munge can read this data appropriately. So I've already read in the schizophrenia summary statistics using fread. And if you look at a particular row within schizophrenia, you'll see that within that SNP column, it's not just the RSID identifier for that SNP, but it's in the format of RSID colon base pair colon A1 colon A2. And that's not something that Munge is gonna know how to read. So prior to actually running Munge, I use these two lines of code to first split that SNP column. So it's just pulling out the RSID using string split and S apply, and then writing out a new VLOS file titled skits with RS. And then for Munge, we list the files, the HapMap3 list, the names of the traits, and then the total sample sizes before running Munge. This is not something I'm going to do right now just for time reasons and because Michelle will have gone over it in the previous video, but just to show you what the code looks like for this first step. Switching back over to our slides, the next step is going to be to run LD score regression, which computes that genetic covariance and sampling covariance matrix that was discussed in one of Michelle's videos. So this is the level of genetic overlap across these different traits is estimated using LD score regression, and then also the standard errors and dependencies across those estimates, as will be the case when there is sample overlap. And this sampling covariance matrix is what allows genomic SEM to produce accurate estimates, even in the face of unknown levels of sample overlap across your traits. I'll just note that before going on to steps three and four, I would highly recommend pausing at step two and actually fitting 
what I sometimes call the base model using the user model or common factor functions. That model that doesn't include the effect of an individual SNP on different parameters in the model, just to make sure that you're getting reasonable estimates, that it fits well, and that Levon or genomic SEM don't produce any warnings or errors about this particular model. Because odds are when you then carry that model forward to multivariate GWAS, a lot of the same problems are gonna to start to show up. So you just wanna diagnose that, make sure you've got this solid base model, and then carry that forward to multivariate GWAS in step four. So going back over to the R script, LD score regression takes the names of the month summary statistics. For case control traits, it takes the sample prevalence of cases over the total sample size, the population prevalence, which can be pulled from the research literature, the LD scores and the weights used for LD score regression. Oftentimes this will be the same folder for both of these and the trait names for your summary statistics. This particular argument, trait names, is important because this is how you're going to name these traits when you specify the model in Levon. So you want to make sure you don't name it something with a bunch of upper and lowercase characters, something that's easy to write out when you go to write your model on later steps. And then you just run LDSC. This will take about a minute with only five traits. Again, I'm just not going to do it here for time reasons. And I'm going to load in that LDSC output that I created before, which is something that I just saved using this command here. The third step is sum stats. And before I go back over to the slides to talk about some of the arguments for sum stats, I just want to read in these arguments and set sum stats up to run. So we're going to just let this run and go back over to the slides to talk about what sum stats is actually doing. So just like MUNS, sum stats make sure that in all cases that the GWAS summary statistics are aligned to the same reference allele. And further, the coefficients and their standard errors are transformed so that they're scaled relative to univariant scaled phenotypes. What that means is that it makes sure that the GWAS estimates are scaled relative to a standardized outcome, or what is sometimes referred to as STDY, are partially standardized regression coefficients and standard errors. We are not standardizing with respect to the predictor, i.e. the SNP, but just to the outcome. And the reason that's important is because we're gonna take the sum stats output and we're gonna add it to the genetic covariance matrix from LD score regression that we just created in step two. And that genetics covariance matrix from LD score regression is itself on a standardized scale where the heritabilities on the diagonal are by definition scaled relative to a standardized phenotype. So we wanna make sure that when we add the sum stats output to that LDSC matrix, which I'll show you visually in just a couple slides, that they're on the same scale so that we can produce the appropriate estimates. In order to do that rescaling appropriately, some stats needs to know a little bit of information about the scale of the outcome and how the GWAS was specifically run. So this takes a number of arguments in order to make sure things are done appropriately. And I just wanna walk through those arguments here. So the first argument for some stats is the name of the summary statistics files. This is not the munged files and should be the same as the name of the files used for the munge function. So it's the raw summary stats that you provide to munge and should be listed in the same order that you listed them for the LDSC function in step two. The second argument is the reference file that's used to calculate SNP variance and align to a single reference allele across traits. Here we're going to use an 1000 genomes reference file from a European population. The third argument is the name of the traits. This will probably be the same as how you've been naming the traits for the LDSC and MUNCH function. And the fourth argument is standardair.logit, which is a vector of that includes true or false for each trait that indicates whether or not the standard errors in those GWAS summary statistics are on a logistic scale. The reason that we make this a required argument is because oftentimes GWAS summary statistics, somewhat counterintuitively, will list an odds ratio, but then they will list a standard error of a logistic beta. And so we want to make sure that the user is being sure to double check this. And this information, if you're unsure, can often be found in the readme file for the GWAS summary statistics for those case control outcomes. The fifth argument is whether the phenotype was a continuous outcome analyzed using an, an observed least squares or what is referred to as an OLS or more commonly linear estimator. 
The following argument is Linprob, which refers to an instance where a phenotype was a dichotomous outcome analyzed using an OLS estimator. This is referred to as a linear probability model and is often run just for simplicity's sake, but it is computationally much easier to analyze a dichotomous outcome using OLS. But in order to do that rescaling, we need to know whether or not this particular situation is occurring. Proportion is something that is specified in conjunction with the Linprob argument and is necessary in order to perform the linear probability model, i.e. LPM conversion above. So it takes the proportion of cases over the total sample size. N is a provided sample size in the order the traits are listed and is only needed when OLS or Linprob is true for any of the traits. Info and MAF filter are standard filters used to filter on imputation quality for info and to filter on the minor allele frequency with package defaults of 0.6 and 0.01. Keep indel refers to whether you want to retain insertion deletions with the default being false. Parallel refers to whether or not the function should be run in parallel and utilize multiple cores on the computer with the default be to run in false. And if you are running in parallel, you can specify the cores argument that indicates whether you want the computer to use a certain number of cores. The summary statistics or some stats argument will typically only take, in this case, it'll take about eight minutes. For 30 traits, it might take upwards of an hour. So you certainly can run in parallel and speed things up, but it's not necessary to run in parallel by any means. So, I know that the sum stats argument can be a little bit confusing. And for that reason, I've created a schematic on the GitHub wiki. So this is on the second page of the wiki, important resources and key information that just walks you through how to think about specifying these arguments. And it starts with this first question, is the GWAS outcome binary continuous? And just lets you know what, how you should specify these different arguments. If we go back over here to R, you can see that I've specified those file names, the name of that reference file, which is available in a box link listed on our wiki, the trait names. For all of these, these are case control outcomes and they are reporting standard errors on the logistic scale. So I set standard.logit to true for all of them. And I use the default info filters. For completeness, I've listed all of the different arguments here but you could certainly write this in a more compact form. You don't have to write OLS equals null, Linprob equals null, prop equals null, if you don't have any OLS or Linprob outcomes. And here I am running in parallel using four cores. We're just gonna let this finish up here. And while that's happening, we'll move on to talking about the GWAS functions. Before doing that, a note that the subsets function will also produce a log file like munge. And so again, it's imperative that you look at these log files and just make sure everything's interpreted correctly. And much like major depression um, that I showed you for munge, we want to check here that for bipolar, the effect column is in fact uh, appropriately interpreted as an odds ratio. So I'm going to first talk about common factor GWAS as a function, and then I'll end by talking about the user GWAS function. What common factor GWAS is doing is it's automatically specifying a common factor model where the SNP is specified to predict the common factor. What's happening behind the scenes for both of the GWAS functions is it's automatically combining the output from step two from LD score regression and step three, which we're running right now from stump stats. So what it does is it one by one takes the LDSC matrix. It takes a particular row for an individual SNP from some stats and it adds it to that matrix. So now that you've got the LDSC matrix and then this appended column or vector of individual SNP covariance effects between the SNP and these five psychiatric traits. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna create this matrix, run the model, and then discard the matrix. And so it's gonna create as many covariance matrices as there are SNPs across the traits. So effectively, if we then take that matrix and run the model, it's then specifying this model where the SNP is predicting this general factor that indexes risk sharing across these five psychiatric traits. 
So this is an example of just one model that's being run. But again, this first vector here is swapped out as many times as there are SNPs, and it's re-estimated to get that updated estimate of the SNP effect on the factor. Common factor GWAS takes a couple of arguments. The first is code struct, which is the output from LD score regression. The second is SNPs, which is the output from some stats. The third optional argument is estimation, which specifies whether the model should be estimated using DWLS, which refers to diagonally weighted least squares, or ML, which refers to maximum likelihood estimation, where the package default is DWLS. The way to think about the difference between these two is DWLS will look to produce model estimates that are trying to recapture the parts of the observed covariance matrix that are estimated with greater precision. This does not mean that DWLS is going to automatically produce things like larger factor loadings for the GWAS traits with a larger sample size. Instead, if you've got a particularly well-powered GWAS that goes into this model, and that GWAS does not correlate very highly with the other traits, then the model will actually prioritize producing, in the context of a common factor model, a particularly low factor loading for that well-powered trait. So again, it doesn't mean that the well-powered trait dominates the model per se in the sense that it's producing larger estimates. It just means that DWLS is taking into account the information that's available. Depending on how you think about statistical modeling, you might have a different preference between them. But to our mind, if you've got more information about a particular cell in that covariance matrix that's going to reflect a GWAS that's better powered, why not use that information appropriately and let the model appropriately favor reproducing that part of the matrix? Cores is how many computer cores to use when running in parallel, where the default is to use one less core than is available in the local computing environment, but you can specify as many cores as you want using this argument. Tolerance is only relevant if you start getting errors or warnings about matrix inversion, but beyond that is not something that you need to be concerned about. Parallel is an optional argument specifying whether you want the function to be run in parallel or to be run serially. GC is the level of genomic control you want the function to use. The default is to adjust the univariate GWAS standard errors by multiplying them by the square root of the univariate LDSC intercept. What that does is it takes this univariate LDSC intercept, which is intended to index uncontrolled for population stratification, and then it appropriately corrects those standard errors by that intercept so that you're producing estimates that pull out that uncontrolled for pop strat. If the LDSC intercept is below one, I'll just note that what the package is going to do is not correct for the intercept at all. So it's never going to produce more liberal estimates than univariate GWAS going in, but it's going to be more conservative as a default. MPI is whether the function should use message passage interfacing, which allows you to use multi-node processing, which we'll talk a little bit more at the very end when we talk about runtime considerations for these different functions. So now if we go back over to R, we can see that the SumStats function is finished up running. It took about seven minutes. And now going on to step four of actually running the common factor GWAS, just for the purposes of this exercise, I'm just going to subset to the first 100 rows of that sum stats output, just so we can see how the common factor GWAS functions are running. So we're just going to let this run here. And as it's doing that, I'll just show you that we've got code struct that lists the LDSC output, SNPs that lists that subset output from sum stats that we're using DWLS, we're using four cores, and we don't need to set the tolerance lower. We're not changing the SNP standard error that it uses. We're running in parallel. We're using the standard GC correction, and we're not using MPI. SNP standard error just refers to whether or not you want to change the standard error of the SNP. This is just set to a really small value to reflect the fact that that's coming from a reference panel. So we essentially treat it as fixed, but it is not something that really affects your model estimates out to the fifth decimal place. So that finished running. So let's just take a look at the first five rows. And what you can see here is that it's pulling the SNP, RSID, the chromosome, the base pair, the minor allele frequency from the reference file that you fed to some stats, A1 and A2, just the run number, 
the particular estimate from the model that was saved, which for common factor GWAS is always going to be the effect of the SNP on the common factor, the corresponding estimate for that parameter, the sandwich corrected standard error, the Z statistic, the P value, and then this Q statistic and its degrees of freedom and P value. There's also this fail and warning column at the end that can be good to check using something like the table argument in R just to see if any warnings or runs were just failing to produce any output. A zero indicates that there was no warnings run. And we can see here that for these 100 SNPs that there were no issues that were raised. Before I switch back over to the slides to talk about Q some more, I'll just highlight that for a lot of this code, I'm just including for completeness the arguments that are listed, including their defaults. So MPI is automatically set to false, GC is automatically set to standard. So we could produce the same output in a much more compact form, writing this code here below. So this will just produce the same results. And it's just to highlight that if you're setting the arguments to the default behavior, you don't have to list them. So what you saw in that output was three columns related to this Q SNP statistic, which is an estimate of SNP level heterogeneity. And the way to think about QSNP is it asks the extent to which the effect of a SNP operates through a common factor. It's a chi-square distributed test statistic that is essentially comparing the fit of a common pathways model in which the SNP operates strictly via the common factor to an independent pathways model in which the SNP directly predicts the indicators of that common factor. If this independent pathways model fits much better than this common pathways model, then that suggests that the SNP is not really operating through the common factor, that this single regression relationship is not sufficient for capturing the pattern of the relationships across these five indicators here. Instances where you might expect Q-SNP to be significant include when, um, for example, there are directionally opposing effects of the SNP on different indicators. So let's say the SNP um, is risk conferring for the first two indicators and is actually protective for the last three indicators. In that case, it's clearly not operating through some general common factor, and we would expect QSNP to be significant. Another instance might be if the SNP has a really strong effect on one of the indicators and a sort of null or at least much weaker effect across the remaining indicators. As a canonical example of this, if we ever include alcohol use disorder or any alcohol use phenotype really within a genomic structural equation model, we often find the variants that exist within the alcohol dehydrogenase genes will pop as significant for QSNP. And that's because those tend to be genetic variants that are not associated with the general factor that alcohol use is loading on, but are instead highly specific to that alcohol use phenotype. And what is cool about QSNP is that when you've got a set of really highly correlated traits, in fact, what might be more interesting is what actually causes these traits to diverge is to identify via this QSNP statistic what it is that really genetically differentiates these disorders. Wouldn't it be nice if we could use QSNP to gain some novel insight about what causes these things to have a slightly different presentation? If you're specifying a model that is something that is not a common factor model, then you're going to want to use user GWAS, which allows the user to specify any model that includes the effect of individual SNPs, such as a SNP predicting multiple correlated factors in the model. User GWAS takes all of the same arguments that I just showed you for common factor GWAS, along with two additional arguments. One of those is the model that you're estimating, written using Levon syntax. And for this model, um, the way that you're going to include the SNP in the model is just to literally refer to it as SNP or SNP in all capital letters. And I'll show that model over in the R script in just a second. The second is the sub argument. And this is an optional argument specifying whether or not you're going to request to save only specific components of the model output. The reason I would recommend almost always setting this argument to something is that there's a lot of different rows for any given model that Levon is going to produce. So for example, for the common factor model, there's the five factor loadings, the five residual variances of the indicators, all of which are going to be fairly similar across all of the SNPs. And it would take up a lot of space to save all of that output for each individual SNP. And what we're really interested in is just the effect of the SNP on the common factor. And so what sub allows us to do is say, I just want you to save that output for the SNP effect on the common factor. And if you're specifying a model in which 
um, you're interested in multiple different parameters, you can also set sub to include more than just one parameter. But again, it's rarely going to be the case that you're interested in saving every single piece of the model output for each SNP. And instead, you should think about just saving those pieces that you're interested in. If we switch back over to our studio to run user GWAS, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run the user GWAS, but for the exact same model as common factor GWAS is automatically specifying. So here we've written the common factor model with the factor regressed on the SNP here on the bottom. And we're also setting that sub argument to just save the effect of the SNP on the factor. So let's set that up to run. And what this should do is produce the exact same estimates that we saw for common factor GWAS. And I'll show that to you in just a second when this finishes up. So if we look at the first five rows from the user GWAS output and the first five rows from the common factor GWAS output, you can see that these are um, exactly the same, 0 0.413, 0 0.413, and so on. The user GWAS output is going to look a little bit different. It's not going to include the Q statistic, but instead it's going to include model fit statistics. What's the overall fit of that model? So it's going to include chi-square, chi-square degrees of freedom, chi-square p-value, and AIC. And those can be used to compare to what are referred to as nested models. So you could examine a independent pathways model where that SNP is predicting each of the five indicators. And then if you did a model comparison across those two models, you would find that that produces the same thing as QSNP down here below. So if we take a look at the run times across this, I know for the first two steps, I didn't run them now, but if you look at the output files, you'll find that for Munge on my own laptop, it took about eight minutes. LDSC took a little over a minute. Some stats took about seven minutes. The common factor GWAS took about 17 seconds and the user GWAS 10 seconds. For those GWAS functions, of course, we only ran it on the first 100 SNPs and we did run it in parallel. This is not necessarily indicative of how long it would take for a million SNPs. You wouldn't just multiply these numbers by a certain amount because there's certain initial steps that the GWAS functions need to go to. At the same time, the GWAS functions do take a while, how long that takes exactly is going to depend on the number of traits and how complicated your model is. So I never know exact runtime considerations, but these are things that you are going to ideally be running on a computing cluster. And I want to talk finally about how to really speed this up so that you can get results as quick as possible. So both parallel and MPI processing are available for user GWAS and common factor GWAS where parallel and serial processing are doing the exact same thing, with the exception that parallel processing is utilizing the cores available in your computing environment to send off different chunks of SNPs to the different cores to then run the GWAS on those cores. MPI takes advantage of a multi-node computing environment. It does require that our MPI is already installed on the computing cluster, but that then adds this additional layer that it sends the output off to multiple nodes and then off to multiple cores within those nodes. And then finally, you can speed this up just that much more by sending off separate jobs that then themselves use MPI processing where they send it off to different nodes and different cores within those nodes. The important thing to know is that all runs are independent of one another. So you can dice up that sum stats output however you want, and you'll still get the same output. So for me, anytime I run a GWAS on the computing cluster, I will send off 40 jobs that then run an MPI. And for this common factor GWAS example, for two-ish million SNPs, that only ends up taking about two to three hours. So again, if you reach out to me and ask what's the exact runtime I should expect for this model, I'm not going to know because it's really going to depend on the type of model you're running. For sure, there are indicators that something is going wrong. Like if you sim it 100 SNPs and it's taking 12 hours to run, that suggests that something is just breaking apart on the computing cluster. And you're certainly welcome to reach out on the Google group to see if we have any input about how best to speed things up. So with that, I'll just end here. And in the next videos, we'll talk about some of the newer functionality available in Genomic Sim, including the ability to examine multivariate enrichment using what we call stratified Genomic Sim.